This episode is sponsored by Plan B Games. Episode 24 of the Board Game Geek Podcast, where we geek out about board games, the mechanisms behind them, and the people who create them. I'm your host, Candace Harris, and I'm super pumped to be here today with a local gaming friend who I rarely get to play with because we're both super busy, but it is Monique from Before You Play. How's it going, Monique? Hi. <laughs> going well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I've been wanting to have you on for a while. And it's like, it's one of those things where we both live in the LA area, but we live <laughs> just far enough away that we like rarely get to play games together just because yeah. of traffic out here is crazy. That um, is so true. We'll like see each other in other parts of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, more often than we do here. Yeah, that is so funny. Uh, but anyway, what's what's new with you? Um, I feel like nothing, but also everything. You know how it is, <laughs> especially yeah. at this time of year. Just work as usual. Um, it's really we're we're like hot into the new release season, so yeah. things are very very busy. But just trying to stay cool generally. Yeah, <laughs> it's been hot yeah. Here. Yeah, cool temperature-wise. Yes, definitely <laughs> temperature-wise. It is really hot in LA these days. How about yourself? Yeah, um, well, I'm pretty good. I <laughs> I just returned last week from Gen Con, mm. and um, I had an awesome time. Like, it's just, you know, this is my third time going to Gen Con. The first oh, wow. time I went was in 2021, which was like the first year back after the mm. pandemic. And yeah. it's it's kind of been cool to see like it gradually grow back to the quote unquote normalcy, mm -hmm. even though I didn't know what normal was because I didn't <laughs> go to Gen Con before. I had never gone before the pandemic. Mm. Um, but yeah, but it was it was super cool. Like we had uh, a small team from the BGG crew was there. Like some people were running the hot games room. Oh, nice. At the Hyatt. Uh, that was cool. Big success, as always, because it's just like people can come play the games, mm -hmm. all the hot new games before they decide if they want to go buy them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was cool. And then Eric and I, Eric Martin and I were on foot kind of like meeting with different publishers, checking out games, taking pictures and all that. Wow. So we can. Yeah. All that. So we can <laughs> report back in like BGG News and Eric was doing some social media but wow you were busy <laughs> yeah yeah and you never so you know busy. how it is at these conventions like um these bigger conventions like you don't really get to play as many games as you would hope yes absolutely <laughs> i mean i've only been to gen con once but i definitely know that that was true the one time we went yeah like, it is a whirlwind yeah it's a whirlwind and you think yeah. you're gonna you think you're gonna be like oh i'm gonna play all these hot new games and it's like no you're gonna get some <laughs> games and maybe you're gonna demo. see them <laughs> yeah, you're gonna you're definitely gonna see them, um, but uh, yeah, I actually ended up. I haven't uh, put any official of like photos or reports out yet from all these different pictures and notes I took from Gen Con uh, because I nice. unfortunately got sick as soon as uh. I got back, and so I'm just like slowly recovering. But um, yeah, so Gosh. that was that was not great, but. But yeah. I had a great time when I was there. Good, I'm glad. And you're doing better. <laughs> yes, better yes. now. Okay, I'm good, doing. Good, good. I'm doing better. Thank you. And uh, I, I just wanted to quick just just say thanks again so much to everyone who stopped me at Gen Con to just tell me how much they enjoy the BGG podcast or my BGG mm -hmm. news contributions or cardboard creations interviews or even just to say hi. Um, it's, it's like, it's so rare that I get the opportunity to engage with listeners, uh, let alone like meet them in person. So it, it really warmed my heart so much and just like kept me sm smiling all day as I'm like running <laughs> through the crowded <laughs> convention hall. And it just like makes me feel really grateful for my job and Aww. also just really appreciative of everyone 
you know, who takes the time to listen to this podcast. Because, yeah. Monique, you and I know this. Like, there's just so much awesome content to consume, oh, you know, yeah. in, in and out of the board game industry, <laughs> you know? Yes. Like, there's just so much. So um, just big thank you to everyone who listens to this podcast. And thanks again to everybody who stopped me to say hi. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, I'm still kind of like, buzzing and you know my heart is like vibrating from <laughs> uh those really nice encounters that's great it's the little things and the big things right that really absolutely. keep you going absolutely yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. and yeah I didn't realize it too because it's like you know with a podcast I'm you know we don't have like a discord server for this where we're like mm-hmm. engaging with the audio you know the listeners mm-hmm. that much so it's just kind of like it's cool to know that there are people out there yeah. <laughs> listening and enjoying it um, on the other I, side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly on the other side. Yeah, because um, sure. I certainly enjoy doing it. So, yes. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, but anyway, today, <laughs> even though it was just Gen Con and we have all these new games, I'm sure you're kind of flooded with new games, either like Essen. Mm-hmm. Uh, preview games or Gen Con yes. releases, new games, <laughs> so new <many>. games, <laughs> new games. But today we're going to mix it up and we're going to discuss oldies but goodies. Yes. We're talking about board games that came out 15 plus years ago that Woo-hoo. are still bangers. <laughs> I mean, like, I I don't, Monique, when did you get into the hobby? You and we got into the hobby in 2015. So I don't know, in the back of my mind, it always feels like that wasn't that long ago, but <laughs> it's getting longer and longer ago. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that was almost 10 years ago. Or I guess, yeah, that's almost 10 years ago. It's kind of wild to think about. Yeah, yeah. Right? I, yeah, Totally, totally. The, it, the same with me. It was like, you know, 2018. Um, it's the industry has just been like growing so much even yeah. since we've been in it and you know things were happening way before we were in it and oh yeah i just i i don't know about you but i like i find it really fun to kind of discover some of these older games that existed before we were into this hobby and yes. finding out that some of them are like really good they're like still <laughs> like really good this um, is actually one of my favorite things to do <laughs> oh to, to find yes. older games yes oh yeah oh, this is cool. Naveen and I we both love this is probably you, when we go to local conventions and such like if somebody wants to play a game we'll say please pick like the oldest game that that is your favorite to play and and show that to us because oh, that's, that's awesome. we love discovering the older gems that is awesome well, mm-hmm. but before we start talking about oldies but goodies, uh, I'd love to hear what you've been playing lately, Monique. Mm. So let's jump into fresh plays. Oh my goodness. Well, well um, <laughs> on our channel, we wrapped up uh, a, a really long standing series where we played a bunch of Uwe Rosenberg's games. Oh, nice. So one of the most recent games that we played was one of his newest designs, uh, which is called Iranian Burger Canal. So this is the first game that I want to talk about. It was actually released this year. So really talking about new designed yeah. by <laughs> designed by Uwe Rosenberg, of course. And it is uh, the the copy that we played is published by Spielworks. Now I don't know how that's changing or going to gotcha. change depending on distribution, but that's the original publisher. Um, and the player count is one or two players only. So it was sort of Ooh. like the perfect game for us right yeah. now because you know we we typically play uh, we play a lot of games at the two player count. Um, and this one was, I, we found it to be really interesting because basically in this game, uh, thematically, you're trying to build the Iranian Berg Canal, I believe <laughs> it's called. <laughs> um, but the way in which you're doing it is everybody has their own player board and there's a whole worker placement mechanism where one player gets three turns, the other player gets two turns. So you're kind of going back and forth, placing out your, um, at taking an action, I suppose, from this action selection area. Cool. And you're just doing things like gaining resources and using them to build industries onto your board. But the thing that's interesting is each industry has a some sort of a benefit or um, 
like a bonus that activates when the time is right. But in order to activate it, you have to have a certain amount of either railroads or canals or just mm-hmm. pathways that are either adjacent to it or somewhere on your board. And the only time you can activate it is either uh, when it's been completely surrounded or if you build like a second bridge, like that's another thing they're going to be building on this canal. Ah, so it's cool. it's really interesting because you're trying to build the industries that will serve you the most, depending on what you have going on on your board. And you're also trying to activate them at a certain time. So it has this cool. really puzzly thing going on for it. And uh, it, it just, you know, when you take, when you look at the game, I, I don't know what other people think, but I, I wasn't expecting that sort of gameplay from it. It's very puzzly. And the whole time you're just engaged trying to figure out how to best maximize your board while activating the industries at the right time. So, wow. Yeah. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds really cool. And I will say I'm curious to know because... I'm not the hugest Uwe Rosenberg fan. Uh, like you're not. I know. I know. That's fascinating. Shocking. Yeah, I I, <laughs> I really liked um, Lahav, and Lahav is one of my favorites. Uh, hmm. But yeah, for some reason, oh, I like Feast for Odin also. Okay. Okay. So, and that was kind of a a. a discovery earlier this year that i'm like okay i see why people like (laughs) love this game i would be curious to know what games you've played uh by uvi rosenberg that made you decide that you're not an uvi rosenberg fan i guess that's a tough question (laughs) i'm not i'm not a farming person so i haven't gotten into agricola but i'm still like wondering when what year it'll be or what day when the day will come where I'm going to be telling people, I love Agricola. Like, it's just, I feel like I'm just, I I can see future Candace and I can yeah. see that at some point I'm going to get what everybody loves about that game. But I've yeah. played it a couple of times and I always am just like, eh. I, I, I think I don't like farming. Like, that's <laughs> the okay. theme. And, that's fair. And I liked uh, Glass Road. Okay. And, and, and when I saw this game, uh, Ornenberger Canal, Mm -hmm. I I think something about the look of it reminded me of Glass Road a little bit, if I recall. Okay. Uh, But I like the fact that this is two, like one or two players, that's like really interesting to me. And it reminds me of uh, Fields of Arl. Fields of Arl, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Uh Fields of Arl, um, which I own that game. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I just like, I ended up getting it at some point because I thought it'd be like a good, like, meaty little two-player worker placement game Mm -hmm. um so i like that i'm just not like real like (laughs) oh caverna (laughs) so where did you have played caverna i have played caverna also okay so you (laughs) don't like caverna either i i'm I'm not gonna say i don't like it i just like i'm not like oh i can't wait to play it again kind of thing yeah that's some people yeah Mm -hmm. so there's just something that usually um doesn't stick with me, but how do you think this one stands up against other Uwe Rosenberg games you like? Oh, this one is very different. I think that's one of the reasons why I liked it so much. It implements the uh, the wheel. I think that's maybe the similarity that you found For with Glass, Glass Road. Road. Yeah. But in a different way. You know, in Glass Road, uh, you are you automatically make resources. Like the, the, the wheel um, turns on its own. And yeah. in this one, you have to kind of play that into your strategy. You have to decide when to make those resources. So I, I thought that was interesting. But other than that... It's a lot more abstract than a lot of his other games. A lot of his other games have an abstract component to it, especially Mm -hmm. in games like Caverna or Agricola or um, even A Feast for Odin, where you're trying to build out your player board in a certain way. Uh, You know, usually it is with like the animals and the farming. But um, in this way, it's a lot uh, more simple. It's very cut and dry. It's just these these cards and then the pathways that you're going to build around your board. That's it. But what he was able to do with it was so fascinating. And the fact that he um, incorporated different decks that you play with every time to just kind of spice things up. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. And it just plays so well at at two players only. Like the fact that he just limited it to two. I like that. I like that a lot. All right, mm. um, you've convinced me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to try it. I actually, I have been like really curious about this one, so I'm glad you you brought it up. And, yeah, uh, I hope you don't hate it now that I, <laughs> I talked it up so much. No, no, I, I, I won't hate it. I won't hate okay, it. Okay, I okay. just, well, I'm just curious to see how much I like it compared to like. I think again, like I think I would say Lahav yeah. is maybe my favorite. Lahav yeah, is very fascinating. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a quite quite an economic game. Yeah. So I can see why you like that one. 
We'll see. I'll have to do an Uva uh, Rosenberg, Uva Rosenberg deep dive at some point. <laughs> but anyway, that is Orion Burger Canal. Yes, <laughs> Oranian Burger Canal. My, Oranian uh, game Burger number one. Yeah. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. So um, the first night, actually, I guess like the night before Gen Con opened, there were a bunch of like different press events that Eric and I bounced around to, and at the one that Hachette. Uh, had they had a little party kind of event um, mm. I got the opportunity to play a game I'd never heard of called Romy Romy and it's R-O-M-I R-A-M-I and mm. it's it's kind of a modern take on Romy which I know I've played I think you know at some point maybe <laughs> um, but I don't remember exactly how it works but this is a new 2023 release. I might have dropped at Gen Con, designed by Antoine Lefabre, mm-hmm. and it's published by Randolph Games and in in the U.S. Hachette. And it's two to four players, and it's basically this like kind of simple, fun little card game where you're trying to score the most points from playing card combinations to fulfill contracts. And I guess the card combinations are where the rumminess comes in to oh, play I see. um because you're going to be trying to like have like two of a kind three of a kind runs three card runs five card runs and all that kind of stuff but the the deck of cards there's a deck of cards it's almost like a poker deck with like normal suits hearts diamonds clubs spades um but one of the things i like about the game that's kind of charming is that the art of the suits is kind of like hand drawn in this like playful way <laughs> Um, so I like that. I, I like the way the cards look. And then when you're playing the game, there are two card markets. Um, there's going to be a row of cards that are going to be four contract cards that are face up. And then there's also like the normal, like playing cards. You'll have six of them face up and on your turn, you do two things. First, you draft up to three cards from the six that are face up. And when you're drafting cards, you're either going to pick cards that have the same number or cards that have the same suit. And again, you can take up to three cards and then you're going to try to fulfill as many contracts as you can that are available in the contract row. Or you can like pass and skip that because maybe you're saving up to do something for a bigger turn later. (laughs) Although that contract might not be there (laughs) when it comes back around to you. So you got to kind of be careful with that. Right. But yeah, then you're going to take the cards in your hand and see if you can fulfill these contracts. And a contract might be just straight up like a five card run. And you say, oh, here I play five cards. There's my five card run. I'm fulfilling this contract. Mm. And you take that contract. Now, all of the contract cards also, besides having some kind of card combo requirements, um, they also have a suit on it. So, for example, I could have a contract there that's I need a pair of fours. And some of them have specific pairs that they're looking for. So a pair of fours and a four card run. And maybe I do that. And on that contract card, if at the bottom of it, it's a heart, any heart cards that I play into that, like to fulfilling the contract, I get to keep as bonus points. So the contract card itself will have some amount of points on it. And then like any cards that I play to fulfill it that match the suit of the contract card, I get to keep in a stack. And they're going to be one point each. They're like bonus points. Mm. So you're trying to like not only fulfill contracts to get contracts that you can score, but you're also trying to score them by playing the cards that the contract kind of, the type of cards that the contract wants. So it's really cool. Um, The game ends, I think, after one player um, has, I think, five contracts in front of them. And then you like finish the round and score And there's one other thing with scoring besides the points from your contracts and those bonus cards I mentioned, but there are these three crowns that are going to be kind of randomly placed at the, at the beginning of the game. Um, Mm -hmm. They're just double-sided tokens. So you just kind of flip them randomly. And these are the the three crowns we're competing over. And Mm -hmm. those are for at the end of the game, majorities, like whoever had the most, contracts that had two of a kind Mm -hmm. um gets three points maybe or whoever had won the most contracts that had hearts on them gets five points you know so Mm. it that's kind of like varying up the scoring from game to game and giving you something else to strive for 
Uh, but anyway, it was just like, it was a really fun little game. Really great for like, I think my mom is going to go nuts for this one. Uh, it's just something you can like easily teach to um, even people who don't play modern board games as hardcore as us. Uh, mm. Just something late to close out the night. And I found myself at Gen Con after I bought it the next day. Um, I found myself carrying it in my bag anytime I was like, huh, I might have an opportunity to play games with some people later. Oh, nice. And it would just be something quick and easy to break out. So, uh, and I did end up playing it one other time when I was at Gen Con and everybody thought it was fun too. So That's um, awesome. And yeah. it plays two to four? Two to four players. Yeah, it's called oh. Rummy Rami. Um, so, that, yeah, I don't know. I was just like kind of pleasantly surprised by that. Yeah, you have me intrigued by that. I really enjoy um, card games, first of all, and then even card games that have that sort of like rummy component, Mm -hmm. because rummy itself is a very, very classic game, very, uh, you know, straightforward. It has like very, very classic feel to it, but you just, it's not going to get old. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And a lot of uh, games sort of borrow that mechanism. I know even something like, um, at least the Filipino rules to Mahjong kind of borrow on the same sort of uh, combination scoring. Oh, cool. So that sounds really interesting. I never yeah. thought, uh, you know, to play with with contracts, like that sort of concept with just having goals, you know, trying yeah. to make those. That's really interesting. Yeah. I have to look for check that it, game. Check it out. And yeah, yeah, even just the decision of which cards do you want to take, because you can either take only cards of the same number or only cards of the same suit from the six cards that are kind of available yeah. at the start of your turn. Like that's that's also, I found that to be a really cool decision point that as well. That is really clever. Have you played it at two? No, I have not tried it at two. I've only played okay. it at four both times. Very curious. Um, but I, like I said, it's it's definitely going to be one of those filler games that I keep in my bag. You nice. know, probably going to bring it to Strategic Con <laughs> if you're there. But <laughs> I'll be there. Let's Sweet. Play. Okay, there we go. This is going to be our once a year where we get to play games yeah. together. <laughs> Actually in LA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, that so was funny. Rami Rami. What else have you been playing lately, Monique? Nice. Well, uh, probably the game that I've been playing the most recently is a. An, it's also a card game, oh, um, cool. and it's a called. It's a card game called Inheritors, and so this game was actually released in 2022, and it's designed by. Je- it says Jeffrey C C H and Kenneth uh, Y W N. It's also <laughs> published. So the original publishers is a publishing company called Ice Makes, okay. and I believe North Star picked it up for a distribution this year. So this is one of like their titles at Gen Con this year. Oh, cool. So I played the North Star um, edition, which has some differences from the original, but the main game is still there. And uh, this game plays two to four players. And basically, in this game, the theme is uh, there's this world, there's this entire world built uh, for this game, and the king, unfortunately, has passed. And so now, you know, of course, they're trying to find somebody to succeed the throne, but there are, I believe, five different clans who, if you want to succeed the throne, you need to win the favor of these clans. Of course. And so, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and so the way that the game works is there's a deck of influence cards, and they're going to be of the different colors of the clans, but they only go from one to six. And so one of your main goals is to um, be able to play these influence cards into sort of a tableau in front of you. But you have to play them to their own stacks. And so if I'm playing the purple clan, I have to start with the number one first. And Ah. then as soon as I have the number two of that purple clan, I would place that on top of the number one. So each clan has their own stack in your scoring area. And uh, you have to play them in numerical order. So I cannot skip the two to get to the three unless you have this other card, which we'll talk about. Um, You have to (laughs) keep on going. But the problem is there are only certain amounts of each number in the deck. So there's only one number five, one number six, and then there's like four ones, et cetera. And it kind of tells you what the distribution is. Um, And so in order to get more cards into your hand, because you're not always going to have the cards that you need, there's this entire market mechanism, which I found to be really interesting. In the market, there's always three columns of cards. And one of the actions that you can take is to discard a card from your hand into one of the columns and then take all of the cards in a column that either match the suit or the number of the card that you discarded. cool. So, and I think that's where a majority of the game takes place in this sort of like this mental game um, of, okay, I'm going to discard this card, but I know that like Naveen needs this card. So I'm going to make sure to not put it into the column where he can just, you know, take all the cards that he needs. So that, that market mechanism is the heart of what I found to be really interesting. 
On top of that, there are also like uh, public scoring objectives where it's like if you're the first person to have two stack or four stacks that show a number two in it, then you can claim that card on your turn. Um, they're also, as soon as you play the number three of a certain clan, then you are now eligible to take the clan leader. And you can only have one clan leader per game. Only one person can have that clan leader. And it bas- basically gives you some sort of asymmetric uh, bonus or ability that's now yours for the rest of the game. Love that. There's also <laughs> face down private objectives if you can discard three cards of the same color. So it does a lot of things in a sort of neat, small box uh, sort of package. And to top that all off there are also additional types of cards that you can play like there's the uh there's the spy where it's like i know naveen picked up the five i need the five so i can play that spy card and force naveen to play the five that he picked up onto my pile so stuff like that it's really interesting you know it's it's a very simple concept but just the 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 different mechanisms the some of its parts you know the whole yeah yeah (laughs) it's it's i I found to be really interesting and i played it now at two and at three players and both player counts um were very interesting for me and even in the last gameplay that we played we were always wondering like well what if you don't what if you can't find the ones or you know you could be in a position where you just don't find the numbers that you need right but there are just so many other tools at your disposal and so many other ways to score that um it's funny the the player who was in that position actually won the game (laughs) so it's a it's a very interesting one I don't yeah. even I have I'll have to look this one up because I can't even picture it, but it sounds really like really interesting. And I yeah. love that it's a card game in a small box because mm-hmm. <laughs> in a world where we have so many big <laughs> boxes coming out every day. Shell just, space yeah, is so limited. Shell space is limited, yeah. precious. So I love finding like little card games that are interesting and they don't take up that much space. Yeah, over oh, yeah. time. It yeah. also is not that long oh, and it yeah. has beautiful artwork. So oh, awesome. definitely re- somebody recommended it to um, Naveen when he went to the last Strategic Con, which is funny. And I oh, wasn't wow. there. So he came home and was like, you have to try this game. <laughs> cool, cool. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of bummed that I missed this one at Gen Con, but I will definitely pick it up and Yeah, we try can bring it, it to Strategic Con. <laughs> please do. Please do. <laughs> yeah. That was my second game. That's called Inheritors. Cool, cool. So I have uh, recently jumped back onto this Terra Mystica kick. <gasps> Are you a Terra Mystica wow. fan? Wow. I okay. I I am a Gaia Project fan. Okay. To be completely okay. honest, Fair. but I love. I did like Terra Mystica first. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I. I can't tell you if I'm a Gaia Project fan or not. Okay. Like cuz I only played it once and it was like way back in the day and at that okay. point I was playing like Terra Mystica a lot and I was like this is cool. Mm. So, I think I was still kind of like new to heavy games. Um but actually Jennifer, Jennifer and uh Bruce uh taught it to me at some point. Oh, this, again, nice. this is yeah, this is like way back in the day. So, I've only played Gaia Project once, but I'm I kind of now want to you know, revisit that one as well. Yeah. But in anticipation for Age of Innovation, I um I played Terra Nova recently. Did you guys ever get a chance to play that one? No, we actually have it. <laughs> I've been oh, meaning to play it, okay. but it's just not one that we've gotten to yet. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So Clay from Capstone sent me Terra Nova at some point. And it's just kind of like I have this shelf of games of like review copy games that I have, you know, that I pull from here and there. And mm-hmm. I, 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 I've had this one for a while and I just haven't gotten around to playing it. And so I was like, let me see what this game's all about. And it's really cool. So this is basically, um, this is Terra Nova. It came out in 2022. It's designed by Andreas Fall and it's from Capstone Games. I think there's a German edition from Cosmos. And, uh, and Andreas is not like one of the original Terra Mystica designers either. This is someone new. Um, Oh, interesting. Yeah. And I actually, so I ended up playing Terra Nova the day after I recorded the last episode of uh, of the BGG podcast, which I had to record a week before Gen Con because of traveling and everything. So <laughs> anyways, I, I played Terra Nova like right after I recorded it because I was like thinking about Age of Innovation, but I didn't have it yet. And I was just craving something Terra Mystica. And it's a really, really excellent, like, introductory version of Terra Mystica. And I say introductory, but I I will definitely say, like, I would be happy to play this version 
anytime if there's like if you know if my audience is somebody who's like not up for something super heavy like Terra Mystica or if we only have like an hour and a half because yes mm. this can be played in an hour and a half and it's like it's it's still like it gives you all the Terra Mystica feels but in a shorter and less like mentally taxing experience so it's mm. it's basically like a watered down Terra Mystica like there are no cult tracks there are only like two resources and like money is the main resource, but you still have uh, the power. It's just like I, I like a little bit. Um, it's a toned down version of some of your power cycling options that you have in Terra Mystica and, and Gaia Project. And oh, honestly, okay. like if you're a heavy gamer, I mean, if you're if you're playing Terra Mystica, you're probably like like heavy games. But um, some people might find it to be a bit boring, the power cycling options in, <laughs> in this version. But otherwise, like it has like, I think, 10 different asymmetric factions that are new. Ooh, um, you still have all those like awesome strategic choices and player interaction, like building and upgrading on the board. It also has I haven't played it with two players yet, but like it has a second um the the game board is double sided, so there's a special map for lower player counts. Oh, and I don't know. Again, like I thought that was really it was like really well done, and like for me, like Matt, my partner, uh, he's not like a super heavy gamer. Like if I taught him Terra Mystica, he's never played it by the way. If I taught him Terra Mystica, <laughs> he would understand <laughs> it, but I don't think he would enjoy it because there's so much going on. But if I instead say, here's Terra Nova, like, then I can get him into, like, the core mechanisms of Terra Mystica in a, like, a shorter, easier to digest package. And then later down the line, be like, yo, here's Terra Mystica. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's what I was going to ask, actually. Like, yeah. does this game fit well for somebody who you don't want to just throw into a game like Terra Mystica? 100%. Hundred oh, percent. Great. Yeah, I I was like really impressed, and like the fact that like I hadn't played when I, at the time that I played Terra Nova, I have I haven't played Terra Mystica in years, and mm. I was just like all those feelings came back. Like, oh, <laughs> I, I love this. Oh, you know, you're competing over those round bonus tiles, and like, yeah. oh, I want to build next to this person. Oh, that person just blocked me. Like, ugh. it's like <laughs> it has to me. It has all of those feels, but in it just a slightly watered down like much shorter playing time mm. game that like yes will be great for people who are more in that medium weight uh range of playing games mm -hmm. and everything um or somebody who might be interested in Terra Mystica but you, you know is intimidated by it you know mm -hmm. start with Terra Nova um but again like I think even as someone who loves heavy games like you you and I like I mm -hmm. personally would be happy to play this version anytime, you know. That's great. Oh, you got like an hour and a half at the end of a game night, but you don't want to like just play a filler game like Terra yeah. Nova, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you should you should check that out. Um, you and Yvonne yes. should check that out. It, it is also on our sh our shelf. We just need to choose it <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one day. <yeah. laughs> I know how that goes. Um, yeah, yeah. But I also wanted to briefly mention Age of Innovation because I did, you know, like I said, we don't get a chance to play a lot of games at Gen Con, but I did get to play <gasps> Age of Innovation. You and, played it. Oh, I love it. I love oh, it. you do? It's so good. Oh, it, my it, gosh. Honey, it is so good. Like, yeah, it is so good. Like, the, Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. I'm like, this is something that just, again, rejuvenated my love of, like, the whole Terra Mystica, Gaia, you know, Gaia Project Universe, like, all these games. And I forgot how much I, like, love them and how good they are. <laughs> I literally, like, like, it was so cool because um, I don't know how much you know about it, but there's, like, all this variability with how you set up your faction because you have different faction tiles that you then will pair up randomly with one of the seven landscape tiles. And then mm. there's a draft for that. So you're always going to have these like different combinations of like how your, your faction is as you're playing the game, which is really Oh my really gosh, I cool. love that. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so awesome. And I swear, like after, you know, you do your initial building placement, like they used to be called dwellings. Now they're called workshops. Um, oh, okay. I, even, I even 
like what they did. Like, you know, it's it's not like super thematic or anything, but like I like that, like the direction they pushed it in. Like there's a new resource where you have to get these books so you can get these innovation tiles, which are awesome. And they also okay. will help your faction be more asymmetric and more interesting. Oh, with nice. Cool abilities. And those kind of like you play with a random set of those and like that's wow. going to change up every game. But like literally after I placed my two workshops at the beginning of the game, I was just like, well, I lost this game. <laughs> like, I was just like, I wasn't, I wasn't next to anyone. Like I had no neighbors and you know, like you get the discount when you build that second, right. when you upgrade to that second building if you're next to people. And I'm like, yeah. crap, like I messed up already, but yeah. I didn't want to like do a backseas. I'm like, I'm just going to like go with it. And yeah. then I just like literally like one thing I love about this game is that like, Every round, you have that round scoring tile and like the the bonus you could get at the end of the round. And right. you're like, I just feel like every round, I'm just trying to say like, how can I make the most of this round and play as optimally as possible and like just maximize my points somehow. And it's like a little puzzle each round to try to just just do your best. And I love yeah. it. It's, it's so hard for me, but it's like, <laughs> so challenging in a like a an exciting way where my heart's racing a little bit like oh like what am I gonna do <laughs> and then long Tense. story short yes yes yeah, long yeah. story short I ended up winning the game <laughs> five player yes. game oh my gosh I was gonna ask I was like I was th thinking that that would have been the best thing uh, ever yes yes I can never play again because I'm undefeated at age of innovation <laughs> Nice. Did you bring a mic with you and just like yeah. throw it to the ground? That I virtually been. did a mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I had I ended up getting some like, I don't remember if it was an innovation tile or a competency tile, but I had something that let me score points at the end of every round for mm. whichever one of my um, science track markers was furthest behind. So mm. I just kind of like leaned into that and I was like, well, you know, there are other benefits of being up on these tracks. So I'm just going to kind of do anything I can to push myself up these tracks. And I like had a little engine going. And then I ended up winning, um, I think three of the four tracks I ended up being highest on. So that I like oh, wow. scored that at the end of the game. Ooh. Yeah. Like it just, <laughs> I, I, I felt like I was trailing the whole game, but I just like picked it up and it was really exciting. And I can't wait to play this game more. I think you're oh gonna love gosh. it too. If you, that's so exciting. I'm really. That's one of the games that I was really looking forward to yeah. uh, from this year. So, and I love, absolutely adore asymmetry in games, and I think that's something that uh, Terra Mystica, the whole sort of uh, series, does really well. Yeah. So the fact that it hits it even harder in this version of the game, and the fact that you can feel like you're losing for so much of the game, and then pull a win oh, out. Love and I think that's what. I feel like that's a, a part of what makes a good game, right? It, there are just so totally. many ways to win. Yeah, I totally agree. And I don't know. Um, so when you get to play it, I'll be curious to hear your thoughts because as someone who prefers Gaia Project, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, it's a new and improved Terra Mystica. I right. think maybe it borrowed some things from Gaia Project, but um, I feel like I've heard one friend of mine say they they still preferred how the tracks work in Gaia Project. Okay, so, so yeah. in Age of Innovation, does it have tech tracks? Yes. Because oh, it does. Yeah. So you you well you have the you have the science tracks, which are kind of like the cult tracks, but it's like a better version of what the cult tracks did. Okay, so when you advance on those tracks, it makes like some an action or something that you do better. No. Okay, so that's, that's what, what Gaia I think Project. Is, yeah, that's why I yeah. think it's not like Gaia Project. In more like Terra Mystica. Yeah, I think okay. like w like when you get to certain spaces, like you know, you'll get little power bonuses, mm -hmm. and then I think you get more income or something. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to okay. picture the tracks now, but yeah, it's not exactly like oh, now I can do this action more efficiently or differently. Okay. Yeah. That is so fascinating. I, I just, I just knowing how we are, uh, yeah. my partner Naveen and I. Yeah. Uh, whenever we end up playing Age of Innovation, I feel like we're going to end up playing literally all the other games. We're going to go to Terra <laughs> Mystica, Terra Nova, just to see. Yeah. You know, just to see what yeah. is, what, how does everything differ, you know? Yeah. And I, <laughs> I never actually played that um, Merchants of the Seas expansion for Terra Mystica. They came oh, out okay. in 2019 at Essen. And like, so I'm, I'm definitely going to be down to kind of like revisit Terra Mystica and like yeah. try some of that because I never played it. And I heard it was actually, 
I feel like that just went under a lot of people's radars. Like there's not a whole lot of content out there on the Merchants of the Seas expansion because I was like curious. But yeah. the couple people I know who played it said it's it's really good. I think you have to be like really deep into Terra Mystica. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like those are the the player the people who I know who have played the expansions. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, Age of Innovation. Oh, love it. Love, nice. love, love it. I cannot wait to play it more. Like I, oh yeah. And now like, again, like you, I want to kind of like revisit Gaia Project Yeah. now that I've have, I have such a different perspective on games than I did when I played it initially. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah. And then like one last thing, I just want to give a quick shout out. One more quick mention um, of another game that I played recently. And this is, this is going to be for, for all the solo players out there or <sighs> anybody who's like, even like remotely interested in trying a solo game. So um, <laughs> after the last, after I recorded the last episode, episode 23 with Rob Oren, he mentioned this game called Veil Wraith. And I had to look it up because I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. And it's a game designed by Tristan Hall um, from a small, I think UK based publishing company called Hall or Nothing Productions. And I started watching some videos and I was like, oh, this looks cool. And uh, they were super nice to send me a copy of it, which actually arrived by the time I got back from Indy. Oh, and nice. uh, when I was laying in the bed sick, you know, I was like, oh, I'm going to try to like play this game in bed. And I set it up and then I'd be like exhausted and like fall asleep. And then I would, like Aww. get some energy, read the rules, then kind of like take a break. But eventually I played it and um, I thought it was really cool. It's this like solo fantasy card game and it, it's set in a world where it's like basically the end of the world. And you can, it's designed to kind of be played as a campaign, but I think you can kind of play it as individual uh, scenarios if you want, or they're called vignettes. Hmm. And you're basically on a quest to find these five keys and you have to defeat any foes, which are like boss baddies. And then you have to like defeat this portal, like you're jumping through this portal. Um, but the cool thing about it is that each round you're going to reveal a card from this threat deck, which you build during setup. And that's where the keys are kind of seated in there. So you're trying to like get through all these different threats and find these keys and like earn them. And to kind of deal with these threats, you have this deck of memory cards, but you don't start with any cards in hand. I don't think I'm trying to recall, but yeah, I don't think you start with any cards. <laughs> so you like literally each turn just draw one of these memory cards, which are cool and helpful things. But the main engine of the game is you have these three action cards slotted. Think like Arc Nova, kind of like oh, okay. or C a Civ, a New Dawn, where you have your action cards in these slots. Mm. Um, but the difference is um, like you have instead of having like hard printed slots. You have tokens. So there's a one token, a two token, a three token. And then the different action cards are explore, fight, influence. So one of them during at, during setup, they're all like set under these. And that's kind of like the strength of that action. Um, but then you can do this thing once per round where you tilt a card, meaning you can't use it, but you just tilt it. And now you can add a plus one like power up token to it. So now mm. whatever slot it's in, it's plus one. And you can, oh. so you're having this choice of like, what cards do you want to start like leveling up? And then when you, you can only use one of those cards, like fully exhaust it, rotate it 90 degrees once per round. So you could either, you know, some of the threats that you encounter, you need to spend explore action points. Some you need to do fight. Some you need to do influence. So you're kind of managing these action cards because after you use one, again, like Arc Nova, for mm -hmm. since a lot of people know that, probably more than Civ A New Dawn, but like mm -hmm. after you use it, you will then drop it down to the lowest slot mm -hmm. and then shift everything else right. And if you happen to use any of those power up tokens, they're temporary. So they're kind of gone. So you're doing this whole thing where you're like tilting cards to like build them up, to use them. And it's it's very like puzzly and challenging but it's really really cool i i, I enjoyed it a lot it's it's kind of like easy to learn um like again you're like trying to manage your resources and deciding when to tilt certain cards when to use them so that That's you cool. bump up and strengthen other cards and uh you're trying to like get these keys 
And to get a key, you need to have a certain strength of influence. So you're mm. like trying to get those. And then when you unlock those, you get other uh, abilities. And it's it's really cool. And then like if you're playing through as a campaign, um, every time you pass through a vignette like or succeed at a vignette, you get to upgrade your memory deck. So you get oh, okay. more powerful cards in your deck. And it's got this like awesome, evocative, monochromatic artwork. Mm. Um, definitely not for kids because they're <laughs> it's a little risque. It's a little scary? Oh, risque? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. There's some skin shown here and there. Okay. Uh, it might be also a little scary, actually, because okay. it's like it's kind of a, a, a darker. Like a dark theme, fantasy. Dark fantasy, yeah. Okay. But it's like really, really cool art. So anyway, I wanted to bring it up also because they have they have a prequel to it called Creel Manor, which is coming out in 2024, and it's on Kickstarter till the end of August 2023, just mentioning mm. the year because I don't know when people are going to be listening to this. <laughs> um, but it kind of builds upon the system and does some new things with it, and it takes place in like before the world ends. So all the art is colored. Um, and in the same style as Vale Wraith. But um, mm. anyways, it's like it's it's a pretty cool solo game. And I would definitely say it would be a good one to start with if you're like new to solo games and kind of curious to try one if you like fantasy themed games. Yeah, that's awesome. That is um, that really sounds interesting. I like that action efficiency. It's almost yeah. like action efficiency mechanism. I really love that about Arc Nova. And I've never played this the Civ game, but I know that oh, that's yeah. sort of like where it comes from. I think exactly, yeah. But yeah. but um, I also just started playing solo games. I'm very interested in, in in this one now. How long does it play? Oh, I I'm I mean I was <laughs> I was playing it sickly from bed, so oh. I was kind of slow getting through it. But I I think that like I could have probably played that vignette if I'm healthy. And now that I've played through a game, probably mm-hmm. in like 30, 45 minutes. Oh. Oh, yeah. that's a really nice, yeah. And I, that fits I, it nice. I felt like I was going to like win it for a second, but <laughs> then I got to like the, the foe and it was like, it was hard. I, was, oh, okay. I started getting, cause like if you let leave threats out and don't take care of them, they start hitting at your spirit, which uh, you have like a, a dial problem. of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so I ended up getting crushed um but i'm like i could do it like but i was excited i'm like i can come back to this and i'm like i understand a little better yeah and like how to manage my cards and also the 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 memory cards can like kind of um buff up some of your actions or give you other Mm -hmm. abilities Uh, yeah that's cool i think you should check this one out um hit these guys up too uh, (laughs) because i i think you would i think you will enjoy it that's awesome. Thank you for that recommendation. Yeah. Anyway, that is Veil Wraith, a um, little bonus fresh play. And the the new version is called, uh, or the prequel is called Creel Manor. Mm. So I'm very excited about it. I backed it. <laughs> I was like, I, I don't need more games, but just, I, I like this system. So I did back it. Um, That's cool. But anyway, let's let's we are here to talk about oldies but goodies, not new games, Monique. Yes. <laughs> I know. What are we doing? What, what's going on? <laughs> and now a word from our sponsor. We made it! The humble journey that started a decade ago in Kansas City, then found itself on the pampas of Argentina, ends in spectacular fashion in the hills of New Zealand. In Great Western Trail, New Zealand, you'll build outposts throughout New Zealand, hire workers to help you find the best sheep and shear the finest wool off of them, and of course, hire a dog to herd them all. Once you've made it to Wellington, put your sheep on ships bound to your warehouses and then to trading posts all over the world. With the release of Great Western Trail, New Zealand, which is now available at your friendly local game store, we've reached the end of the Great Western Trail trilogy. As it's often said, When one trail ends, another one begins. Are there more adventures in the cards? Maybe a railway to bring us to new herds, towns, or ports we haven't explored? Or workers and buildings just about to be discovered? Keep an eye out, ranchers. You never know when another adventure will begin. Well, let's let's jump right into it. I'm very curious to hear which games you picked and if we have any crossovers <laughs> me too i'm excited i this will is, uh, this is one of my favorite topics i just wanted to uh reiterate that this is such a fun yes. it's really fun just finding older games and digging through libraries to, to yes. play them and stuff 
Yes. And I, I will say also, like when I when I was originally kind of uh, sending um, details for this to Monique, I was like, we picked 10 plus years ago, games that came out in 10 plus years ago or more than 10 plus years ago. But I was like, that's kind of like newer. So then at the last minute, I was like, let's do 15 plus. Um, and even still, like, yeah, I was just trying to like dig dig back really far so mm -hmm. um my list is going to be ordered actually from newest to oldest I oh really mine's the other way around oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny so well, this will be very this will be very interesting yeah do you have any like honorable mentions you wanted to drop like oh. anything I I guess I do because yeah. I was trying to curate the list, but a couple of the games um, I hadn't played very recently, so I didn't want to add them to the list and then not really be able to describe them in full detail. Yeah, yeah. So I guess I, I should just mention this because I, I it almost made the list. Um, it is a game. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out when it came out now because this game actually is getting reprinted. So it Ooh. is a bit cheating. It was <laughs> originally it. it was originally published in two, in the year 2000, <gasps> which cannot believe is 23 years ago now. Um, and it's called The Princes of Florence. Oh! This is yeah, it's been it's getting republished this year, and actually, it has new artwork on the box and such by uh, WizKids now. I think yes, um, but I think originally it was published by Aaliyah, and it's designed by Wolfgang Kramer, Richard Ulrich, and uh, Jens. I think Christopher Ulrich. And the one thing that I know about this game <laughs> that I can explain is uh, it has an auction. You have polyavano tiles. You're trying to fill your board with them. Um, but the auction itself is really interesting because you can only auction out one specific type of piece. And there's going to be stuff like parks and um, forests. I'm forgetting <laughs> all the different things. that uh, Forests that you, and lakes. Yes, forests and lakes. Thank you. Because everybody has these profession cards that you want to, uh, to have, whatever the combination of stuff on the profession card, whether it's a certain type of building uh, slash uh, these parks and stuff that you want on your player board in order to score them. But only so one person can win the, that tile per round. It's really interesting. I, um, I'm laughing over here. I don't know if you noticed because this is actually on my list. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's on your list. It's, it's totally great because uh, when you were like 2000 and you were like, there's a reprint. And I'm like, oh, maybe there's uh -oh. some other game from 2000. <laughs> But yeah, I'll just kind of just chime in since you brought it up. Yes, um, please, please. Yeah, so so back in and back in like 2021, my good friend uh, Derek, he's part of the uh, heavy cardboard crew. Um, he kind of discovered I was newer to gaming and realized I hadn't played a lot of classic Euros. So he like made it his personal quest to teach me as many classics as he could when we were at this gaming event together. That's awesome. Yeah. So he taught and don't say anything if it's on your list because I'm okay. not going to go into detail, but he taught me Macau, Goa, St. Petersburg and Princess of Florence. And nice. I thought like, I thought they were all great, number one, but like Princess of Florence, I was just like, this is like really, really cool. Like you have this like, again, auction. I love mm -hmm. auction games. And then you're, yeah, like the choice of which thing to auction because yeah, you're only auctioning one thing. So yeah. it's like, like you were saying, like forest, lakes, parks, maybe is the other one. Yeah, there's like um, the jester, right? Yeah, That's you like can get the else. jester. Um, the jesters are going to help you score your like profession cards more like with higher points. It's like kind of mm -hmm. a little engine building thing. Mm -hmm. Then you have these builders. You can auction off to get a builder. And if you have a builder, um, if you have one builder, it makes the cost of uh, play, uh, buying a building a lot cheaper because usually That's buying right. a building is 700 florins yes and then if you have a builder it's only 300 and then if you have two builders you can now put buildings adjacent to each other in your little neighborhood board That's right because yeah, you can't usually build buildings adjacent to each other yeah. so you need the second builder to be able to do that and then on top of that if you have the third builder all your buildings are free so like they're cool <laughs> And then the other thing that's auctioned off is uh, prestige cards, which are like basically end of game scoring objectives that are mm -hmm. private, um, which is really cool. And you get to draw five cards, choose one. Like anytime you're drawing cards in this game, you get to draw five, choose one, which mm -hmm. is awesome because you have like a lot of choices. But yeah, you do the auction 
And then every, but every player is going to get to um, start an auction and auction something off, but it has to be something different. So if Monique au- auctioned off jesters, I can't pick jesters if I'm next to start an auction. I have to pick mm-hmm. something else. And then you each take two actions on mm-hmm. your turn and you can buy buildings. And when you do, you're going to place them on your little player board. Again, you can't touch buildings against other buildings unless you have the second builder <laughs> also. <laughs> um, and then you can also buy more character cards, like these profession cards. Mm-hmm. You can buy these bonus cards that will help them score better. You can buy these things called freedoms, which are also something else that's going to help you score these character cards that's better. That's right. It's really, really good. And um, WizKids hooked me up with the new version I oh, nice. at at Gen Con and I actually um I haven't been able to like really play games because I've been sick. Mm-hmm. Um but like Matt played it with me and he loved it. And we just played a two player game and oh, really? it was still fun with two players. Like the auction is definitely gonna be like more interesting with uh with more players. I think right, it's right. usually like best at five, four or five players. But it was mm-hmm. still like really good and it was like a tight competitive game and it's beautiful the new version is really beautiful yeah i was wondering that because we have we actually have the older copy of the game on our shelf and we didn't play it for so long because that's another reason why we really love finding older gems is because the box cover for a lot of these games (laughs) it it doesn't really (laughs) yeah really tell you you know like what this experience is going to be like right right and that was in particular, uh, in particularly true for the version of Princess of Florence we have. But um, we went to actually a strategic con and two friends of ours, David and Nate, they were like, you've never played this? Like, we got to play it. And they yeah. taught it to us and we were just so, so shocked. But you're right, at higher player counts, the auction does seem more interesting because um, you can only actually purchase one thing yes. per round. So you can, it's not like you can buy out the whole thing. So you have right. to be very selective about what you are going to hold out for. And you, the players are the ones who are actually putting things up for auction. Right. So you have to wait for somebody to put up the item that you want to buy. Uh, for it's really interesting. And and imagine the mind games of playing this with two players because yeah. like whoever doesn't like so you're like up bidding someone for something and maybe you're doing it to do something that you don't really want, hoping that they'll take the bait and like up bid you and then all of a sudden right. they pay like six hundred seven hundred dollars for something and then you're like okay cool now i can buy anything else for three hundred dollars right like, you know yes. so <laughs> I, I i'm not mad at that um the uh, two-player version <laughs> I, I thought it was really good and it was cool. cool like again matt like loved the game he's like you could tell he was like getting into it oh yeah. nice yeah and then like the one other thing that's cool with this new version is that there's a solo mode um, which I haven't tried yet, but yeah, there's like an Automa deck to, wow. to play it solo. Um, it also includes the Muse and the Princess expansion, which adds oh, these like that. six character cards. And I don't think I played with that. I don't remember actually if I <laughs> the first time I played this, if I'd played with the expansion or not. But that's all included in the new WizKids version. And then on top of that, there's this cooperative building expansion which it's not like you and i are playing together on the same team but we can you they the opposite side of your player board like everybody connects so that you're kind of like neighbors with other players your your player board that you're placing the tiles on are touching your opponents and so like on my turn if i go to build i could be like if i want to build on the border of um my neighborhood and your neighborhood, Monique, I could be like, mm. hey, can you pay such and such, pay me such and such to, I don't remember if it's you pay me or you pay part of the building cost because it's like, it's my action, mm-hmm. but I'm building a building that's going to be on both of our boards so that both of us technically have access to that building. Mm. So I was like, this sounds neat. I yeah. I'm very curious to kind of like try that because there's like Explore some negotiation one, yeah. With oh, how you okay. place buildings and everything. That's um, cool. But yeah, I'm glad. Uh, sorry to like go on a tangent, but I had to tell you that like, this, <laughs> this game is, uh, I really like this game and I had been wanting it for ever since the first time I played it, but I didn't like <laughs> love the the look of the, the 
like I think they did a reprint the red box. once. <laughs> yeah, I actually like I liked the ori- I think I liked the original one better than the one that they did when they reprinted it years ago. Oh, okay. Um, Cuz there were like two versions, but anyway, I'm just happy that it's more accessible um and this new version is uh, really good looking. Yeah. The other cool thing is like on the the player boards Instead of just princes of Florence, you can flip it over and have a female, a princess of Florence. Oh, nice. Yeah. So every single player board can be flipped to a female side if you would like oh. to play with a female. That's um, awesome. And then uh, there is one other like random thing that I kind of found when I was like looking into like the designers of this game and everything. Uh, one of them. So I, I, almost everybody knows Wolfgang Kramer um, mm-hmm. and Richard Ulrich. Uh, but Jan's... Christopher Ulrich. I was like, I didn't really know, you know, what he had done. So I clicked mm-hmm. on him on BGG and I found out that he and Richard Ulrich desi- co designed a game back in the early 90s called like De Oculus. And it was basically a trivia game all about um, environmental protection. So (laughs) it says in like to quote, it's like guides players in an original and informative way through the everyday world of the environment and helps players learn more about the essential protection of our environment as they game. I was like, how cool is that? Yeah, that is so endearing. (laughs) Yeah, and it was in the 90s. It was in the 90s. So I I thought that was just a cool random fun fact. Yeah, that's really cool. But anyways, what other honorable mentions did you have? Um, I had one other one. Well, I tried to pick games that, uh, because we talk a lot about um, older games, I guess, on our channel. So I tried to pick games that we don't talk about a whole lot, even though I I still added some. But one of the honorable mentions is actually one that you mentioned. It's Goa. Oh, nice! (laughs) Goa Goa has got to be maybe one of our all-time favorite games from 15 or more years ago. I don't actually remember when that year that game was published Mm -hmm. but that is that was i think the first heavy game that i had ever played and i didn't know it was heavy until i played it (laughs) and like (laughs) i ended the session my brain was sweating um it doesn't look like much you know the the game is is a it's it has a large auction um the first half is like this big auction where you're auctioning off tiles and then the uh other part of it is everybody plays it takes player turns and you're basically just trying to push your your action cubes down your board yeah. <laughs> to score points, but you're also um, you're also growing crops because it's like Portuguese traders in India go as a, a place in India. So yeah, that one's a really really fascinating one. You played it, yes, think, right? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. I think I've only played it once, maybe twice, and I I loved it <gasps> also. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that yeah. It's a cool game. And I, I think now that you're mentioning it, I do remember that you guys love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Naveen in particular. He, he used to teach that game at uh, Strategicon, actually. I think I remember when. that. I think I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. I I kind of just met, I have like just four that I'm not even going to like talk about much. But like I was just doing a check at some point to see like, huh, like what else do I know that was like, you know, came out yeah. back then. Um, and one of the games is Teach You. Um, which hmm. came out in 91, but like I have only played Teach You like once and then I like loved it and I never got back to it. And it's something that I I would like to kind of explore more. So that's, that's part a card of the reason. Game, right? Yeah, it's a card you- game. Oh, okay, it's okay. A, like a partner climbing shedding game. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So I definitely want to like revisit that at some point because I remember just like being like, oh, I'm buying this. I got the app. And then wow. I just never kind of got back into it. But I know a lot of people who absolutely love it, love mm-hmm. it. So, That's um, awesome. and then just on that 15 year mark, <laughs> Battlestar Galactica came out in 2008. What? <laughs> yeah. Battlestar no Galactica way. came out in 2008. And that's like one of my favorites. So I just want to quick give that one a shout out. Um, is that the one that has the hidden yes. traitor? Okay, yeah, okay. like I played that one. People might be Cylons. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I Matt uh, loves sci-fi shows, and at some point was like, "Oh, you got to watch this show," and I was like, "Oh, fine." And then I ended up <laughs> loving it. It has like the coolest soundtrack if you like drums, like I do. 
Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the sh- the show actually, and it, I watched the, we watched the newer version of the show because I think the original show was like there's like an older version of it. Um, oh, okay. And then uh, Hansa Titanica almost made the cut because, but it was 2009. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Yeah, but I was like, that still feels like so classic and old, and it's such a great game. Oh yeah, I cannot believe. Wow, 2009. That would have made the original cut, right? The <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but when it, when that I is, changed it from ten years, I was like, "Oh, I can't say that." Is such a good game! Wow. Yeah, and then I said Twilight Struggle also, which came out in two thousand five. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, just because it's like I love card driven games, and that was like, yes. it's like very intense. Yeah, and it, it influenced <laughs> so many other great card driven games that are out, and yeah. it's just a great game. Very intense. Very intense. Yeah. All right, awesome. so let's jump to your number five. <laughs> All right. So uh, my number five is a game that was released in 1992. Wow. wow. There are so many iterations of this game now. It's designed by Reiner Knizia, I think. Maybe the original publisher is Hansem Gluck. I don't know now, okay. but it's called Modern Art. Heck so, yeah. Yeah, it's a game for three to five players because in this game, this is an auction game. Like, almost pure purely but uh, in this game you're basically auctioning off different pieces of modern art and so there are modern artists um i don't know if the different published the different versions of the game have different types of art but um but in in any case uh, the one that we have is very beautiful you know obviously very beautiful cards and uh, on your turn you're basically going to choose one of the cards from your hand and you're going to auction it off and on the card it tells you what type of auction you have to do there are five different types of auctions and they can range from like a pure auction where everybody just starts screaming out how much they're willing to pay for this card or um, a one round auction or a blind auction stuff like that and uh Basically, at the end of the round, you're going to pay out uh, only the top three artists who sold. So you could spend all your money on some artist's uh, piece of work and not get any money back for it. But the thing that's that I found to be most interesting is, say an artist... Um, makes it to the top three artists in the first round. And so if they are if they were the one who sold the most, they get, I believe, 30. It's like 30, 20, and 10. But they don't sell anything in the next round. Um, and But they sell more again in the third round. It's cumulative. So now, say, for example, if that artist sold and they get, if, and you get paid 30 for each of their artwork in the first round, and they sold again in the third round, and they sold everything for 10, then now in the third round, everybody gets 40. For each of the pieces of art that that they purchased, so it's really fascinating. I, I chose this game because I'm not a super big on auction <laughs> mechanics. <laughs> it's just so much math. You know, you really have to do the math in auction <laughs> yeah. games in order to win. You need to make, make sure, sure you, that you are broke. paying less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Naveen, my partner, is really good at that. He just knows, like, well, I'm I'm paying this much for it. I'm not going to pay more than that because I'm not going to get more. You know what I mean? Like, you have <laughs> yeah, to do that math. Yeah in your head. But modern art is just so fascinating because of the fact that 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 meta game of like, oh, this artist has sold so many pieces already in this round, you know, what valuation am I going to give the rest of the cards in my hand or right. um, the round ends as soon as I believe a fifth piece of art is is being prepared to be auctioned off, the round ends immediately. Um, and just the timing of that is really fascinating. Um, and so that's that's got to be probably my favorite auction game the fact that it was released in 1992 is wild wild. yeah Yeah. i i love modern art as well and i actually it almost made my list Uh, (laughs) but i don't know if it's that you know it's it's always hard to kind of compare and i actually i don't know what my favorite auction game is that's something like i'll have to give some thought to at some point and talk about it on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but I, this was something that like when I moved it, when we moved into our current place, uh, Jennifer actually gave me as a housewarming gift, uh, modern art, the version, it's like a white box with like, there's like an orange or something. Oh, on the, yeah. I think that's that the version the- that we have. Simon. I think it's, yes, the, I think it's Simon. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's very sweet of Jennifer, by the way. <laughs> yes, that was super sweet. She's always trying yeah. to like make sure I stay, you know, an omni gamer and I'm educated on things. <laughs> yeah, and she's yeah, really she knew I had never like played it, so she's like, "I'm gonna give you modern art." <laughs> That's so nice. So that was, uh, but yeah, every time I play it, it's it's a hit. I don't play it as often. Like Reiner Knizia is just great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. especially at auction stuff. Oh my goodness. Yes, um, but yeah, that that one almost made my list. 
But so, so you started at 1992 and I did the opposite. (laughs) So I started with my uh, most modern game on the list. And that is Santiago. Hmm. So Santiago is a game that came out in 2003, designed by Claudia Helly and Roman Pellick. And it's an, uh, the version I have is from Amigo Games, but they're supposed to, and I had to like track it down and print English rules for my copy and everything <laughs> like that. And I forget like how this game even fell onto my radar. I just, I want to say it was something like heavy cardboard related mm. um, that I saw either they were playing it or talk, somebody was talking about it on an episode. I don't really remember, but anyway, I'm really glad that I discovered it because uh, it's an awesome game. And in last year, I think at Essen, this uh, publishing company called Treffle um, released a new version, but I like I have not seen it anywhere oh. in the U.S., so I don't even know if people have it or what. But hopefully, <laughs> it's something that's coming because I think like a lot of people would really love this game. It plays with three to five players. It has auction. It has an auction like bidding phase. There's a bribing aspect to it, and there's like some area majority scoring. So okay. Basically, the the main board, like we are kind of working in, uh, I guess, like a plantation or something like that. And each round, we auction off these different crop tiles. So there might be like bananas, potatoes, uh, green beans, whatever. There, I think there are like five different types. Mm-hmm. And so we flip them over randomly, five, you know, a certain amount based on the player count. And then we go around and we bid for basically uh, initiative to take one and place it on the board. So mm. whoever bids the highest is going to get to pick first and then they'll place it on the board and then the second highest will pick which one they want, so on and so forth. And the way the scoring works, so throughout the game, you're going to be putting these tiles out on the board and you're going to be trying to, uh, in most cases, trying to place like similar type crop tiles next to each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you want to have more of your ownership cubes on them. So if I have a group of, let's say five banana tiles that are orthogonally adjacent to each other touching, um, and like I have, I happen to have five of my ownership cubes kind of spread on these five tiles, I'm going to get 25 points or $25. It's a money equals points kind of game at the end of the game because, because of that. But maybe Monique, you had on the same, like, plot of banana tiles you had two of your ownership cubes so you would get two times five because there are five banana tiles so you would get 10 bucks i would get 25 so you're constantly trying to Mm. build out these tiles so that you're making groups of crops that you're kind of involved with um bigger for scoring bigger but then you also want to make sure you have more ownership cubes on them and some of the tiles will have um, space for you to put two of your ownership tiles when you build it. And some of them only have one. And so the other thing is, um, since these are crops in a field, Mm -hmm. they need to be watered to not Mm. dry out. So, (laughs) uh, yep, of course. So at the beginning of the game, you randomly put out this like blue tube. That's like the start of your like irrigation. And, you every round are going to place at least one of these blue sticks, which is like water that's going to water two or maybe two or four crops that it's adjacent to. So picture like a grid and you're putting these blue sticks Mm -hmm. in between um, the crop tiles. So who gets to pick where the water goes, Monique? Well, that is the canal overseer. So whoever, (laughs) whoever, uh, bid the lowest amount or passed first during the auction gets to be the canal overseer for the, for the round. And uh. you, the other players, are going to bribe them to put the water where you want it so that you can make sure your crops are wet. Because if your crops don't have water, remember I told you some of the tiles will have two ownership cubes? Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's not watered, one of your ownership cubes is going to come off. If next round it's not watered, another one of your ownership cubes comes off. And maybe you have no ownership cubes. And then if it's still not watered, it's going to flip over and dry. So now Uh. it's not contributing to the scoring. So there's this whole thing where 
you know, you are thinking about strategically when you want to be the canal overseer because your money is hidden in this game too. Mm. So you never know how broke people are. Um, <laughs> but like then, you know, some people will get desperate and be like, oh no, I need to make sure this area is watered. I will pay five to put it there. And maybe you're like kind of working with me because like if the canal overseer puts it there, it's helping you too. So mm. our bribes kind of go in together. And you're like, I'll pay three. So now they're getting eight if they do it. And the thing is, the canal overseer could just say, screw you guys. I'm going to pay eight to the bank instead, and I'm going to put it wherever I want. So they could either oh, take, okay. take one of the bribes or they could pay, um, I forget if it was the, like the lowest bribe or the highest bribe, to probably the highest. That to, is powerful. To, to then put it wherever they want. And everybody starts the game with one like emergency water stick um so <laughs> okay. each round there's the potential for a player can play that and that's like a hail mary you only get one you never get it back so you do have a potential lifeline um but that kind of goes in turn order so if like maybe i needed to use my emergency water stick this time but like naveen was before me and he decided to use his now mm. I can't because only one person can do that around. <laughs> oh, oh, that is interesting. So, yeah. So it's like a really simple game. I've played it with non-gamer friends, gamer friends. And every time it's just so fun and yeah. everybody ends up loving it. And again, you're like, you're <laughs> like, number one, you have this, this auction phase. And then you, after you auction and place these tiles, now you're like, oh, shoot, how are we going to get water to them? So then you got to bribe, <laughs> start doing the bribing. There's a lot of like right. t fun table talk and player interaction. And um, yeah, at the end of the game, whoever has the most money um, scores. So you'll you'll get paid out for all of your uh, your ownership tiles based on the size of the groups they're in. Oh my gosh, that's political. Yes, it, and it, it's really funny. <laughs> the that, drama. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really funny that you say that because... Uh, the first time we played this game with our friends, Ka our good friends, Cassie and Jake, it was their first time playing. Matt and I had played it before. <laughs> and literally during the first auction, we got into this like 20 minute debate on like where the first tile was going to be placed. <laughs> like, well, no, if I take the bananas and put them there, you have to tell me you're going to take the other bananas and put them there. Well, why oh should gosh. I do that unless blah, 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 blah. Well, then we can co-bribe the canal overseer. You know, it it just like, it felt like we were in a like agenda phase for TI4, like talking, yeah. like voting on a law or something. And it's like, yeah. no, we're just putting out some crop tiles, guys. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's super fun. Uh, have you ever played it before? I have not. I have not. But that sounds really interesting. Are you allowed to bluff like can i bid money i don't have no i don't think okay, you can okay. bid money you don't have because okay, i don't okay. think there are any loans in this game yeah okay there's... yeah because what there would have to be a penalty right yeah for i you think, doing you're, that I think not... you're forced to pass because it's not like okay. something where you can lose victory points to take money okay um, that's good but yeah so you could kind of get caught like that too yeah and right. get get outbid but at that point like you pass early and try to be the canal overseer and try to make yes. money from bribes you know and have all the power <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you do get like every round at the end of the round there's some income also like i think okay you get, like everybody gets three bucks or something every round so yeah. you're not going to be completely broke but it's just like this super fun game every single time i've played it not many people know about it and i'm glad they made a new version of it but hopefully that'll be <laughs> available because I don't I again yeah, I know <laughs> I have not seen it I knew there was a new version coming I actually thought it was going to be not till this year and I looked it up and it was like 2022 I was like oh, ah. nobody I haven't seen this anywhere so hopefully it mm. makes it uh around so people can actually get it but yeah Santiago banger absolute banger from 2003 nice well uh it's interesting that you chose a game that has that sort of negotiation because my game number four is like almost all negotiation. This Ooh. is a game that was released in 1997. And um, like I was mentioning earlier, we just finished playing a bunch of Uwe Rosenberg games. And honestly, a lot of his games were released uh, more than 15 years ago that are still really good. But I chose to include a game called Bonanza. So, have you played this one? Yes, beans. beans. It's beans. It is farming. I mean, not okay. Not all of Rosenberg's games are farming themes. Like a yeah. fair amount of them are not. But this one happens to be farming. <laughs> um, I think it's published by Hansem Gluck, 
and it plays oh no sorry uh, amigo. amigo amigo right and it, it plays uh two to seven players but you really want to get to like that like five player range you know the more the better because yeah. in this game you are bean farming all of the cards are these silly beans you have red beans chili beans you have all sorts of beans and they they're all <laughs> like they've all been um they're 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 alive like they have faces and stuff like these are people beans and uh, each player has their own bean field that can hold at most two different types of beans there are several versions of the game now i know in the older versions you could purchase a third uh, bean field but i know there are additions now where you don't have access to that um, but basically you have a hand of bean cards and you are not allowed to rearrange your hand this is the game where you have to keep telling yourself do not <laughs> do not put down your hand it has to stay, stay in the same order because on your turn, you are required to plant the rightmost, I believe, whatever the first slot is on your hand, into one of your bean fields. Now, your fields can only hold uh, one type of field. You cannot mix blue beans with red beans or so. And if ever you have to play a card that you don't have a bean field for, you're forced to either sell or get rid of one of your, your fields, which is really not ideal. And then you can often play a second one. But then... You draw, I believe, the top two cards from the deck, and you start negotiating with everybody around the table. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, some people want, you know, the beans that you drew. Maybe you drew beans that you don't have the fields for. Um, and the thing about these these beans is on the card itself, it tells you how many coins you're going to get for selling them, depending on how many of those cards you actually have in your, in your field. Some of them are more valuable than others because some, maybe there are only three of that card in the entire deck. Right. So yeah. it's this really hilarious game of you saying, OK, I'll take that blue bean off your hands if you give me this bean or maybe you can just <laughs> give people beans. And it's just this really silly theme. <laughs> and you're yeah. Just, yeah. It just gets really political for like very bean strange game. reasons. Yeah. With the silly bean art, too. <laughs> silly bean art. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put this on my list, because if you look at that box, like that's that's I, I don't know. It, it's a it's pretty dated. Yeah. <laughs> it's very like yellow with just this bean. You, I know the first time I saw it, I was like, I have no idea what I'm getting myself into if I were to play this game. <laughs> but it's hilarious, and it can get really political quick. So, um, so that's that's really funny. Like I love Bonanza, and uh, so that's an Uber Rosenberg game. I do love. Yes. I have not played it in forever, but I just it's something I feel like I always keep on my shelf. You know, yeah, like yeah. I, just in case you have that ju opportunity, right? just in <laughs> case. And um, something that's relevant to recently at Gen Con, I discovered there's a new version of Bonanza called oh. Dahlia, which is basically I don't think any rules change, but it's basically Bonanza with beautiful flower cards instead of beans. And what? The, and Beth Sobel did the art. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was like, I, I, I did not know this going into Gen Con. Ooh. It was just something, either somebody I bumped into had picked it up and I was like, oh, I didn't even know that existed. Wow. But yeah, so if you if you want to get this game or if you already love this game, but maybe you're tired of looking at cartoon at the beans, beans. <laughs> and you want to play it with some beautiful flower cards, like I think it's called Dahlia. Um, okay. And I actually did end up uh, bringing that back. From Gen Con, I bought oh, a copy did. of that. So yeah. it's not like they're not silly flowers; like these are beautiful. No, they're beautiful Beth flowers. Flower. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That you know that makes sense to me to retheme something like that because we. I feel like we are going into an age of board gaming where yeah. artwork is absolutely a part of the experience. Yeah. And for some people, they want to be able to play with stuff that is more aesthetic rather than. I mean, these beans were drawn to be funny. Like that. <laughs> yeah. That, it is a comedic <laughs> decision, right? And they're beans. But for yeah. some people, yeah. But for some people, the flowers are, are probably going to speak to them more. Yeah. And so, so that's like, what a great way to kind of, you know, get this game into more people's households and like get more yes. people to try this this awesome game that came out in what, would you say, 1997 or something 1997. Like yeah. It's crazy. A long crazy. while ago. But yeah, but, now... Um, now I'm like excited to revisit either Bonanza or as Dahlia. And, or as Dahlia. I'll try to remember to bring this in my bag for Strategic Con. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that is my uh, number four. That's Bonanza. Awesome. And my number four was Princes of Florence, which we've okay. already talked about. So I'm mm -hmm. going to say we jump right to your number three. 
My number three. So I actually have a few games on my list that were released in the same year, which makes me think for anybody who was playing board games in 1997, good on you. That was a good year. <laughs> okay. That's awesome. Um, this is a game designed by Reiner Knizia, who probably rocked a lot of this time frame. Yeah. Um, and it's published by Hansem Gluck for two to four players. And it's a game called Tigris and Euphrates. Oh my goodness. That's my next one. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> Yes. Oh yes. my god. Do you want do you want to describe it? No, I don't. Because no, no? I okay, haven't okay. played it in a while. And actually <laughs> actually I haven't played it in a while. Like my my thought is just like I love this game. Yes. Abstract strategy, tile placement, kind of like with this like war game element yes. to it. Like very elegant, simple actions, challenging decisions. I yes. love the scoring system. Yeah. But yeah, okay. you you go ahead that, if, if you played it more much- recently than me. That pretty much encapsul- encapsulates why I love this game oh, so, so much good. and why I think this this game really, it, it, it feels like a classic. You know, this really yeah. stands the test of time because there is so much tension in this game with very little, really. Because in this game, everybody plays as a different faction and we each have our own leader tiles. It's not by color, it's by symbol. So maybe, I don't remember ex- exactly what the animals are. Maybe I'm like, is there a bull? <laughs> one is like, I um, think there's like a bull or something. There's like yeah. one that looks like a bow a and arrow maybe. or something. Okay. Yeah, yeah, everybody is yeah. a symbol, which is like Everybody different. is a symbol. You're not yes. like a color, but instead right. you have four different colors for your yes. symbol. Yes, because uh, there are four different types of leaders and they are represented by the color. So each yeah. player has a set of these. It's like red, green, blue, and maybe yellow, like one of, one of the other colors. Black. And so... A black. Red, yes, green, black. blue, and black. Yeah. And black, yes. And so uh, there is a board that has different spaces where on your turn, you're basically going to be placing out either one of your leaders or you're going to be putting out one of these uh, tiles. Yeah. And the tiles are going to be the same colors of the leaders. Um, the blue tiles can only be placed along the river. You know, there it is called Tigris and Euphrates after all. And then all the other tiles can be placed um, anywhere else on the board. But while you're placing out these tiles, you're building out different, I think, civilizations, which are basically just uh, blocks of orthogonally adjacent uh, tiles with players' leaders. Yes. They're like the regions catch, or something. Yeah. Yeah. The catch is each uh, grouping or each civilization can only have one of each type of leader. And so if I have my uh, red leader in an area and somehow uh, maybe Candace's red leader also gets attached to that uh, area, either by somebody placing a tile that connects them or or something like that. Yeah. Um, we go into battle. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that's the part that's really tense because yeah. you you are trying to gain points throughout the game, trying to be peaceful while trying to avoid these moments. But as soon as there's a possibility of you going into one of these battles, you need to be ready. And so in Tigris and Euphrates, the way that combat works is you uh, have to be adjacent to temples. There are also these temples that are going to be placed out. And you also have to, uh, to have temple um, tiles behind your screen because all of the tiles that you have are going to be kept secret behind the player screen. Yeah. Um, and so when battle occurs, it's just basically who is adjacent to the most temples and who can also discard the most from their hand will right. get that one red point. Now, the other catch to this game <laughs> is there are four different types of points and they correspond to the different colors in the game. And so anytime somebody adds a, say, for example, I add a green tile to a civilization, whoever has the green leader in that civilization will get a green point Yeah. because uh, there's only one of each type of leader in there. And then at the end of the game, you, the player with the most number of points in their lowest scoring color is going to be the winner. So I you're also that. trying to balance all four of the different types <laughs> of points. It's really tense. Yeah, There's so I much tension in this in this neat little game, right? Well, it's I, quite a big game oh, now, it's but so good though. It, it's so good. Um, it's been re-implemented. The only thing it, it has been re-implemented by Yellow and Yangtze, mm-hmm. same designer. Just uh, they he varied up some things to make it a little bit more uh i i can think made a little more streamlined i want to say have you played yellow and yanksy i have not played yellow and yanksy yet okay and also phalanx just did a re-implementation of yellow and yanksy called huang i think it was i think they they had it on crowdfunding for gamefound but it's also going to be out later this year oh we have Um, oh, oh oh okay it was on it was on crowdfunding this year I think it was on crowdfunding either earlier this year. I'm losing track of time. I think it was earlier this year, and I think it's going to be out around uh, Essen or sometime in the fourth quarter of this oh, year. Oh, that's great. Um, so that's like a different – and I don't know exactly what all the differences are between that and Yellow and Yangtze. 
Yes. Um, I don't remember exactly, yeah. but I remember feeling like Yellow and Yangtze was a lot more streamlined. It basically, any, any parts of Tigris and Euphrates that I felt iffy about, they kind of fixed in Yellow okay. and Yangtze and made it a little bit more strategic. It's oh. still very tense. Um, but Tigris and Euphrates, even if you don't play Yellow and Yangtze, Tigris and Euphrates stands on its own, 100%. It's, it's very good. Yeah, it's, so, it's one of, I haven't played like uh, Through the Desert or... Like all of the Reiner Knizia like abstract strategy games, I have played Samurai and Babylonia, and mm. I liked them both a lot. But I don't know. There's just something that just pops for me more about Tigris and Euphrates, and yeah. I'm I don't currently own it, but I'm I actually just messaged someone the other night about trying because I really want the first time I played it. It was with the the I think the Mayfair edition. One of the older ones that has like the wooden castles and the cubes oh. and everything. And I was like, I need this version of it. <laughs> That's cool. So I've been trying to track down a copy because I know like the it's a little easier to get the is it Fantasy Flight or somebody who or Z-Man. Sorry, Z-Man oh, the did Z-Man. the okay. more the most modern version of it. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, now now I definitely want to try Yellow and Yangtze also and Huang. Yeah. And anyway. um and just kind of like see how they fare against Tigris and Euphrates, but yeah, yeah, absolute yeah, beast tense, of a game, tense game, Very. tense game yes. for something that has such like simple actions, like yeah, like really, Very really tense. good. You never know. You got to watch your back at all times. It feels yeah. like, <laughs> and I, and again, like the scoring system. I love games that do that, where it's like you're scoring multiple things and your end game score is whatever the one is that you got the least of. Yes. So <laughs> like you, you uh, beer and bread does that. <laughs> yes. You cannot, it makes it so that you can't specialize. Yeah. Right? You cannot just put all your eggs in what you have to do everything. Exactly. So, and that makes it even cool. more challenging. So that's funny that like in our <laughs> timelines here of you going from oldest to newest and yeah. me going from newest to oldest that we both ended up at number three with Tiger City Brady's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is really interesting. I I'm now wondering if we have any other crossovers. <laughs> well, I'm starting to get more recent, so we're oh yeah, that's, so that's now our we won't. Path we're done. Yeah, we're yeah, done. We're done. We're done. We're done. Okay. Um. <laughs> so I guess. Okay. So I had the same number three as you. So then okay. you you go ahead and tell me your number two. <laughs> my number two. Yeah. Okay. Well, my number two is I, this is the last game that was released in 1997 from my list. I'm sure there are <laughs> other bangers from that year, but this is the the last one from my list, and it is designed by Stefan Dora. My version of the game is published by Eagle Griffin. Plays three to six, and it's called For Sale. Have you oh, played For Sale? I've never played For Sale. <gasps> I know Candace. that is the proper oh reaction. Gosh. I've never played for sale. I have kind of like almost picked it up so many times because I, okay, please bring it to Strategicon. Yes, I we're just gonna have will. like a vintage <laughs> gaming table. <laughs> yeah, definitely because yeah, okay, I'm really shocked. This is <laughs> this is such a great game. So. The version that I have of it is like the travel edition. So just okay. so you know, anybody listening, there are different editions of the game. The travel edition has the entire game in this tiny, tiny box. And so this is a game that was my most traveled with game. Our, our version of it is all banged up now because we brought it <laughs> everywhere. But this is basically another auction game, I guess. I guess this one might be my favorite. But basically in this game, <laughs> you are trying to buy and sell houses. <laughs> it's a real estate. Cool. Um, and so the game is played over the course of two phases. And during the first phase, everybody is trying to bid on these houses. And so the deck, I believe, is numbered 1 to 30. And the um, all the cards are, are, are unique. So there's only one number 30. There's only one number 15, etc. And the higher the cards go, the more, I guess... I should say the more extravagant the house becomes. Like, I think the number 30 house is in space, like, just so you know. And <laughs> um, and in each, uh, each round, you're going to put out a number of cards equal to the number of players so that everybody has a chance to acquire a, a house. And everybody starts the game with a certain amount of money. And so then you go into an auction. And the auction is basically going to be for the highest valued house that was revealed. And you just basically go around until everybody's passed, and the, the first person to drop out of the auction gets the lowest valued house that is still on the table. And you basically go like this until all of the houses that were put out um, get purchased. And you keep on playing rounds and rounds until all of the houses have been auctioned off, all 30. 
Okay. And then you start the second phase by taking all of the housing cards that you purchased into your hand. And they now become your, your hand of cards that you have to play because you're now going to sell them. And the way that that <laughs> works is very similar to the first phase in that you, you put out a certain number of, uh, of money cards equal to the number of players. And the money cards range from like at the most, I think, 15 I don't know if it's 15,000 or 50, I don't know, but yeah. I just say $15 all the way down to zero. There are zero, there are literally nothing. Oh, like you could wow. purchase a house and then sell it for nothing. But I guess that's how real estate goes, right? <laughs> and so the way that this, that this phase works is everybody is going to simultaneously choose one of the housing cards from their hand, put it face down, and then at, at the same time you reveal. And then you divvy out the money according to the values around the table. So whoever played the highest valued uh, house is going to get the highest amount of money on the table. And you just keep on going around. So it's interesting because even though you purchased the number 30, which is the highest valued house, because of the way that the money comes out, you might sell it for very little oh, because wow. you're not always going to have the $15 card come out in that round, if that makes sense. Yeah, So it's yeah. this game of like trying to remember, okay, I know that you know, Naveen has the 25, I have the 26. Like, when is he going to play that card? Like, there's only one 15. How many $15 are in the deck? Like, I don't want to sell this house for less than I paid. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's really fascinating. Ah, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. It's all cards. It's just, it's a card game. It's, it's really, it's a really neat design. And it's one that we still have in our collection that I don't see leaving. <laughs> I'm going to get it. For a long time. Yeah, I'm going to get it. You, you've convinced me. Like, there have been... <laughs> Many moments over the past, like, you know, five years yeah. that I've been like in this hobby that I've like thought about like, oh, I should I should try that game. I hear everybody says that game's great, you know, yeah. and I just kind of have not tried it yet. But I'm now you got me excited to finally <laughs> try it. It, it sounds it's super fun. It's also very fast um, and you can teach it to all sorts of gamers. You know, we will bring it to our families to, to play like after dinner and stuff. And it's everybody just ends up really loving it. So. That Super. is my number two. That is for sale. Okay. All right. Yeah. So now we definitely won't have crossovers at this point. Yeah. So my number two game I have talked about on the podcast before, and uh, it's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Um, it's a game that came out in 1995, and uh, similar to uh, – it has two of the same designers of Princes of Florence, and oh. it's Wolfgang Kramer and Richard Ulrich. And this game was originally published by Hamza Gluck <laughs> in 95. <laughs> it plays with two to five players. And it is known as the granddaddy of area control games, <gasps> El Grande. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was that reaction because you have never played El Grande or because you I forgot have. to put it on your list? Or you no, just I've played El Grande. Um, I, that is a very fascinating choice. <laughs> fascinating, fascinating. Oh, th this, rea this reaction has me very curious to hear your thoughts on it. Yes, I'll, I'll tell you about it. I'll okay. definitely say. Okay, okay. Um, but anyway, El Grande is this, like, it's like one of the OG, like, area control or, like, area majority scoring games. Mm -hmm. It's set in Spain in the 15th century. Um, the main board has, like, different regions, and each region has a different amount of victory points that you'll score for if you have the most of your caballeros in there, or your little cubes, or mm -hmm. the second most, you might get some points, and sometimes the third most, you might get some points. And then there's also, this um, the tower. What is the tower? The Castillo. There's a tower <laughs> where you could be placing cubes, um, and you won't know how, unless you have a really good memory how many cubes different people have placed <laughs> in there. You play nine rounds, and after every three rounds, there's a scoring phase where you're gonna like score every area. But during a, a round, you have at the beginning of the game, you have this hand of like I think one to thirteen power cards that are one they range one to 13 and each round you're going to play one in turn order and whoever ends up playing the highest card for the round is going to get to have the initiative and take an action first and um but the thing is like when you play these power cards um they're gone so if on the very mm -hmm. first turn of the game i play my 13 um, yeah, I'm going to get to go first, but now I don't have my 13 anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something you kind of have to factor in. 
But basically, uh, some of the power cards are going to allow you to get caballeros, which are your little cubes, from the province, which is like kind of like the general supply, into your personal supply, which is called the court. So one of the things that you're managing is making sure you have little caballero cubes in <laughs> your court so you can actually place them on the board like when you take actions. And then there's also this uh, king pawn that's on one space in one region of the board. And um, you have to place your cubes, I think, adjacent to it, but you can't place in where the king pawn is the when region. you're like placing them on the board. Uh, mm -hmm. But then there's one of the actions you could do is to move the king pawn. And um, so you're doing all these things and like the and then the action cards. Yeah. So they're going to be uh, they're going to be a certain amount of action cards available. And that's what you're again you're trying to get dibs on first pick of those. Like if you, if there's something you really care about, cause the action cards are going to let you manipulate cubes on the board, give you some other like cool powers. Um, and it's also going to indicate how many cubes I think that you're able to like put on the board for that round. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. So there are a lot of like d just decisions from this simple, like, selection and it's a hard choice but like of wh <laughs> which power card you want to play and then like once you figure out who's going first then you know choosing which uh, action card you want to take because it's like maybe you don't want to leave that other card for Monique but you really want to take <laughs> this card and mm -hmm. so there are like all these like really cool decisions that come from that whole system like just the power cards and then the action cards mm -hmm. um, and then when scoring uh, pops off Everybody's going to pick a um, secret re uh, a secret region. I think it might be, I forget the timing of when you do it, but all those cubes that you then dumped into the Castillo Tower, mm -hmm. um, you're going to get to move them to a, some region on the board before all the different regions score. And mm -hmm. everybody kind of like dials that in secretly. And uh, then you also have like a Grande cube that <laughs> gets put out and... Um, like, I think that gives you more points towards area majority scoring, if I recall. Um, but anyway, I just I think this game is so awesome. I love that it's such an elegant design, you know, mm -hmm. like everything except maybe the look of it um, still <laughs> feels so fresh to me. Like if I compare it to like other like area majority scoring games, I'm still like this is such a like a fascinating engine um, of just playing around with these action cards. And I love area majority scoring games anyway. So mm. I love the player interaction of them. Um, and yeah, I just, this, like the minute I first played this game, I was like, oh, this is like a permanent game in my collection. <laughs> um, so, so That's uh, awesome. I, I, yeah. So I take it. You're not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Okay. For context, I, Area majority slash area control <laughs> is probably like one of the, my least, I don't know. I, I struggle. I struggle gotcha. with those kinds of games. Gotcha, they, make gotcha. me, they, they really stress me out. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. They stress me out and I, I have a hard time figuring it out in the yeah. game because there's so much that you have to consider. You have to like, in area majority games, you really have to look a few steps ahead. Yeah. You know, and you, and every decision you make, you have to really calculate what are, how are they going to react to the yeah. decision that you make. And um, I've played El Grande once. Mm -hmm. and what is the, what's the max player count on that? Five. We maxed out the player count. Yeah. yeah. And it was my first time playing it. And it was like, because of everything, it's kind of a funny game, you know, <gasps> yeah, like when yeah. things unfold, people laugh, like a lot of things right. happen that, that you don't expect to happen. Mm-hmm. And because of that added wrench, like I really could not plan anything. <laughs> it was like gotcha. it was chaos, like chaos. Gotcha. And I was just like constantly like <laughs> doing exactly the wrong thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I can definitely see why people who love Area Majority love that that game. And that game is like people I like they really mention it like over the years. Like that's that appears on people's lists as being like their favorite area majority yeah. game. It's really well loved. So I can I can definitely see that. But if you but, don't um, like that mechanism much, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might oh not. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of player interaction, a lot of things yes. that can kind of go down with the action yeah. cards. But like yeah. that to like to me, I enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's that's it's fun funny. for me. Um, 
uh, just trying to mitigate some of that. Like, uh, again, like, oh, if I don't take this card and use it, someone else might do it and they might yes. try to screw me over. Right. Yeah. 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 It is very strategic in that sense, but it's also very funny. And I can appreciate that. But about I'm, that, that game. I'm glad you don't love it too, because I mean, that just goes to show like they're just. So, like, not everybody's going to love every game, you know? Oh, yeah, and yeah. Everybody has, like, kind of, like, just different opinions and, like, different things they get out of games, different things that they don't necessarily love. Yeah. At the end of the day, it comes down to preference. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but I actually really love the farming. <laughs> <laughs> So there you have it. There you have it. Yeah, yeah. It's very different. different (laughs) We're on the opposite spectrums with farming and area majority games. Yes. (laughs) But we do align on our Venn diagrams do align on a lot of games. (laughs) They do. They do. Absolutely. (laughs) Awesome. Well, that is El Grande. Um, Monique, what is the last game on your list? Okay. My number one is probably the game that I talk about the most. It's still on our shelf. Um, and one of the first games that we played getting into the hobby, this one was released in 2004. So it is the most recent. Okay. That, I, I was doing the math over and over again. That is more than 15 years, yes, right? That's, yes. Yeah. It just doesn't <laughs> seem like it. 2004? Oh, my goodness. Okay. It's designed by Klaus Jürgen Verde, I think. Okay. Published by Amigo uh, for two to four players. And it is called The Downfall of Pompeii. <laughs> Have you played that game? I have not played that game. And I'm like, <gasps> the, the name sounds familiar and it's probably because of you guys. Oh my gosh, maybe. We love, we've, oh my gosh. Downfall okay. Downfall of Pompeii. We first played this game at a an international tabletop day celebration, which I don't even know if they celebrate anymore. But back when we were getting into the hobby, that was a thing. And okay. We went to our local, um, our local friendly gaming store, <laughs> <laughs> nice. and uh, they had a copy of it on in like their library where you can just play. And I kid you not, we played it once, we bought it immediately, and then played it over <laughs> and over again for like the next three to four That's days. Awesome! That's two awesome. player, I love that. just two wow. player at home. Um, wow. In this game, the theme is a bit unfortunate because it's something that really happened in history. It's right. about uh, the the Pompeii, you know, when when the volcano exploded, right, right. And everybody had to get out of the city. And so in this game, it's actually also played in two phases. The first phase, you are playing cards to populate the city with people, people of your color. And they are all represented by these tiny um, uh, cylinders, cylindrical cubes. Uh, and the the board is actually really interesting strategically because all of the buildings, you're actually putting them into different buildings. And they're okay. all numbered, but they're also color coded, which is going to be important because you play a card. It tells you how many of that type of card are in the deck. So you can kind of decide which card to play and which uh, building to place out in. And then you place uh, one of your people into that numbered building. The buildings only have a certain number of slots for people. So you can't just put, you know, a, an infinite number of people there. But there's also a relative bonus. So when you place out a um, uh, one of your people into a building, depending on how many people were already in that building, you can place out more into oh. either a building. I believe uh, they're building the same color or a neutral colored building. And so your goal here is to just literally get out as many of your people as possible. Because gotcha. at some point in the game, one of the cards will get pulled, which signals the start of the next phase, which is, of course, when the volcano explodes. And you need to save all your people. You need to try to get them out of the city oh, before um you know before they're taken by the volcano yeah and so during the, the whole second phase of the game players are going to be pulling these lava tiles from a bag and on the board the lava tiles themselves have symbols on them and on the board there's a one starting spot or, or i don't know if there's one or more but there's definitely a starting spot for each symbol and so if it's the first tile that you place you have to place it out on that starting spot but starting with the second tile of that same symbol you can choose what direction the lava flows in and if you ever cover a spot that has people oh. in it, then you take all the people and you throw them into the volcano. So oh, snap! Oh. <laughs> thematically horrible, but but yeah. yes, that that is a way for you to uh, to to remove points from your opponents. Wow. And then on your turn, you're moving up to two people in the direction of the exit. There are only so many exits on the board. Gotcha. And it, that is also strategic because the number of spaces they can move is equal to how many um, of the cylindrical people are in that square when you start your movement. So it's it's really fascinating because you're, you're spending the entire first game trying to populate the board and then it's the whole half of the Running. second half of the game strategically trying to just get as many of your people out as yeah. possible. Yeah, wow. Because at the end of the game, whoever has the most people out is the winner. Wow. So it's wild. I've seen this I've game really um, 
implemented in different ways over time. Like I know at conventions they've had like giant downfall of Pompeii where it had this like huge volcano. I know some people put like a candle light inside their volcano to make oh, the volcano cool. scarier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a it's a fascinating design. That's it's a 3D volcano. That's cool. And like the fact that you guys were just like enjoying like what uh how many players did you say it plays with? Two to four. Two to four. And you guys were still like just having a blast playing it two Playing players. it at two. Yeah. It's because it's both strategic, but also chaotic because you can't, you know, you cannot anticipate what tile is going to be pulled next. You yeah. can just make educated decisions. Right. Based off of that. But yeah, it's it's fascinating. It, it released in 2004. I actually thought it was older than that. Just because hmm. if you see the box it cover. It looks dated. It kind of has that 90s, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that 90s box. But I guess it was 2004. Is this out so. of print? Uh, that is a great question. I I feel like it's still in print, but okay. I could be wrong. I'm gonna check into. It. I'm gonna check into it. It yeah. sounds it sounds really cool. It actually like reminded me a little bit um, of uh, a game that Pear Sylvester designed called Polynesia that came out a couple years ago. Oh, okay. I don't know if you ever played that, but yeah, you're trying to um, get these. There's a volcanic island that you have all these meeples on and you're trying to like get them uh, further out. And it's like kind of a logistical puzzle, like oh. very like minimal, minimal randomness to this game, too, which is really cool. But it's kind of like more of a uh, medium to lighter weight game. And okay. you have to have boats to get to different islands, but you can use other players boats, but you have to take one of their meeples as a guide. Um, <laughs> oh my god it's really actually as i'm thinking about it now i want to play it again um that, but, i've never played it but i would pretty much play anything by pierre sylvester i know right same he's, designer as the king is dead yes right? yes yeah, oh, yeah. what a game and brian brew yeah he's yes. I, I really like his um game designs yeah um but I yeah that one that. just kind of like i think it came out in like 2020 i remember when we were doing all the like the live streams for different conventions since nobody could go to mm -hmm. conventions i hosted someone from the publishing company that makes it and then it was like one of those things where like i was like okay this is cool i'm asking them about the game but then like later i was like that game seemed interesting and i was like and i started like looking into it more and that yeah. was probably even like that might have been before i even knew before i played the king is dead but i was just like this sounds like a neat game and yeah. um yeah i think that's another like not that many people know about it but um i enjoy it quite a bit and it's Poly that's awesome Polynesia. But um, downfall of Pompeii. Yes, I'm gonna, number one. I'm going to try to snag a copy of that. <laughs> and then my number one game is super old. Ooh, super old. Um, from 1979. <gasps> wow, it is Dune. <gasps> oh my yeah, gosh. Dune. I love, and I have the 2019 edition of it, but like. I love Dune. Um, Dune is designed by Bill Eberly, Jack Kittredge, and Peter Alatka. It's from Gale Force 9. It plays with two to six players, and it's based on Frank Herbert's book, Dune. And wow. um, to me, like, I'm a huge Dune Imperium fan, um, yeah. but, like, this is the, the most thematic Dune game I've ever played. Um, so each player leads like one of the key factions, like you're the Atreides, the Freeman, the Emperor, the Spacing Guild, the Harkonnen, or the Betty Gesserit. And every faction has like awesome thematic asymmetric abilities um, that are really cool. There is like, <laughs> there's area influence and, and, <laughs> and lots of like negotiation opportunities and you can form alliances with people. Like, this is a game that, like, you'll probably, it'll probably be, like, a five or six hour game. Um, oh, okay. Wow. But it's, like, a really cool, but it's not, like, that hard. Like, that's one of the things I like about it is that, like, the players kind of make the game really, like, interesting and tense. But, like, mm. the rules aren't that hard. Like, you go through some phases, you put some spice out, you, like, yeah. you move people around the board, you try to get spice. Um, but the other thing is the combat system is really juicy. You have like a combat dial and then you can like, so if I'm in combat with you, like we both are going to set a dial to say how many of our troops we're kind of like putting into this conflict. And cause oh, you okay. might not want to sacrifice them all. Cause, um, I think if you, if you lose, I'm trying to remember if you, if you win, if you still have to sacrifice the ones that you kind of bid, but you're like, oh, okay. You have certain troops, then you have leaders that you can play, um, these leader tokens that you can slot in to like beef up your combat. 
um, strength. And then there are treachery cards. You can do stuff like there's traitors. Um, so there's a lot of like bluffing and like tension that comes from this really, really cool combat system. Again, like the asymmetric abilities are really cool. Like, mm. um, I don't know how familiar you are with like the the lore, the story behind. I Jupiter. have listened to, I've watched the movie, and then yeah. I listened to like half <laughs> of the audiobook. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. I've actually only read half of the book, and oh, okay. I watched the it's new. Long. <laughs> yeah, I read. I watched the new movie probably like four times. Maybe me too. Yeah, I loved it's so it. Good. It's Gosh. So good. Yeah. yeah, it's so good. It's so good. The soundtrack ugh, just gives yeah, me chills. Me too. Me too. The cinematography. Okay, yeah. So I yeah, yeah. and that and I've actually seen the old movie once, which is like <laughs> kind of silly and ridiculous <laughs> and wild, um, but cool because it's like it's unique. You know, yes, um, yes. but anyway, like the one thing, like the Benny Gesserit player in the game, like during battle, like during combat, you can use the voice and I could be like, oh, cool. you cannot play a poison weapon or oh, I can say okay. you must play a poison weapon or something like that. And like, that's one of the cool things because you're like using the voice, the uh, Atreides player, I think like you get to um, like, I don't remember if you get to like know what like look at cards that you get these like uh these different cards but you have data on cards that people have and you can oh, kind of okay. use that to your yeah. advantage like the framen you can like ride the worm and whereas the worm would maybe like attack um or harm other factions you can like ride it to a new destination and that's funny it's just <laughs> it's this is definitely like um, it's not area control like or area majority like El Grande, um, okay. but I know you like asymmetric factions. I um, do. So if you've never played this game, I definitely uh, recommend like you and Naveen checking it yeah, out because it's that's like awesome. It's a, it's another one of these games. Again, it's so old, but it's still such a banger. It's wow, like seventy. Wow, seventy nine. It came out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like oh, like forty four years old. <laughs> and again, it's like the like, it's like the most thematic. Um, and the reason it's long is because of all the like negotiations you can have in the game and stuff. So if you like, yeah, if you really wanted to like keep it a little tighter, you could say, okay, we'll only do like alliance talks for like five minutes or whatever. You know, you, you could kind of put a cap on, <laughs> <Just> yes, clock, <laughs> exactly on some of the negotiations. But um, yeah, it, I played it for the first time earlier this year and. I just I, I still think about it and want to like play it more. It's wow, it's just, that's awesome. Yeah, it, it, it's really cool. And again, the other good thing, like I said, is that it's not overly complex. Like if you were like, I'm coming over right now to play it, it would probably take me like five to ten minutes to refresh myself, and then mm -hmm. would be like, let's go. You know? Wow, that's really so, cool. I think that's the best when the system itself is not. It's not about the system. It's about the what people are doing yeah. around the table with the system. Yeah, how right? we interact with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If a game can really kind of inspire that sort of experience, that's yep. really cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So anyway, I'm really glad that you were down to like talk <laughs> about oldies but goodies. Yeah, and, and And I didn't realize <laughs> that you were like, you know, that you love <laughs> finding yes. these, old, these old games. And um, it, it was definitely cool that we overlapped on our number three with yeah. Tigers and Euphrates, <laughs> but also like now I know some games that I didn't really know much about. Yeah, and likewise. I need to pick up. Um, but yeah, awesome as always, Monique, talking to you. And like, yeah, I'm you. stoked that Strategicon is only a couple weeks away. Yeah. I've, I've missed the last two. So I'm excited to go there and we will have to play at least one of these like old card games or something, something yes. together while we're there. We will bring these. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I remember well, to pack them. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I want to have Naveen on at some point too, but uh, thank you yeah. again for being here and uh, I will catch up with you soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Board Game Geek Podcast, produced and edited by Candace Harris. Special thanks to Matt Fonda for editing and mixing our music. Be sure to visit us on the web at BoardGameGeek.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitch under BoardGameGeek. You can reach us by email at podcast at BoardGameGeek.com. Thanks for listening, and happy gaming!